Good morning. Wonderful to see people today. And uh, thank you also for the warm welcome here since I left the pastoral ministry. Uh, talked to Pastor Joey, and uh, he said, yes, I could be permitted to come and share in worship and fellowship with you, and so grateful for that. I have um, had a painful experience with technology today, though. The last thing I did last night was to check the flash drive, and uh, there were only three things on it. I'm working right now with the Salvation Army Kettle Campaign, and I had a master copy of all the people who volunteered so far. And by the way, if you want to volunteer, I'm needing more people. There are about 700 spaces to fill between now and the 24th. So love to help your help. Anyway, there was that, and then I put our scripture passage, Genesis 13, on uh, background of birch bark, and uh, that was on there, and then I had slides to go along with the message. And um, because I'm going to talk about directions into Israel, really wanted to show you some of the pictures that represent those. And um, then I clicked to see whether or not it was safe to remove it. My computer said, safe to remove. I pulled it out and when I gave it to Jen. She looked at it and she said, but it says this folder is empty. <laughs> so I don't know what I said it beside that it erased everything. Um, I am hoping that I have, I'm pretty sure that my Salvation Army stuff is backed up on the, my base computer at home or else I'm gonna have a very late night tonight typing everything back in again. But nonetheless, we can still come to the word of God, and I trust that uh, this will be a blessing to you today. <clears throat> Let's bow in prayer. <coughs> Lord Jesus, even when things go wrong in our lives, as the songs we sang and the scripture that we read, we're so grateful. You are there for us in each and every circumstance. We thank you for your Holy Spirit present in each person here and giving us a sense of unity as a fellowship. And now, Lord, may some of the things that come from your word be a blessing to my sisters and my brothers. In Jesus' name, amen. So we think back about how Abram trusted Jehovah to lead him from his home in Mesopotamia, which was to the east from Israel. We notice how circumstances, even though he was such a giant of faith, sometimes things would get him down and he would start to act on his own impulse rather than to trust in the Lord. Not long after he got to Canaan, a drought struck, kind of the opposite to the river of rain that we have now. They had just constant, steady rivers of sun, and it dried everything up. Abram should have stopped to pray first, right? But he didn't. Instead, he headed through the Negev, and um, if you look up some pictures on the internet of the Negev, it's one of the most ugly deserts, I think, that there is on the earth. And for a guy who um, is a farmer, herdsman with all kinds of uh, cattle and sheep and goats, to think about driving them through that, going through the Sinai Desert into Egypt, that was a pretty crazy thing to do. Once he got to Egypt, though, he had an even bigger problem because it had to do with his family. They took note of this guy and his uh, herdsmen and all his family, his nephew Lot, and the great big um, 
train of people that, and animals that were coming. They couldn't just kind of quietly sneak into Egypt. And obviously at some point, Pharaoh went out to check on them and he noticed that Abram had an absolutely gorgeous wife. And he talked to Abram about her and Abram started to shake and quiver. And he said, well, that's my sister, which was half true because he married his half sister. So it wasn't like he told an absolute 100% lie. So Pharaoh took Sarah, gave Abram a whole lot more wealth, gold, silver, uh, jewels, animals, made him much more wealthy man. And he put Sarah into his harem. But then life began to crumble for Pharaoh. All kinds of things, tragedies happened to him. And I don't know how it was that he figured it out, but he realized that Sarah was the problem. Well, not Sarah. It was Abram and his lie that was the problem. And he went back and he talked to Abram about it, discovered, yes, she was his half-sister, but he had also married her. And I think Pharaoh must have understood God was pretty powerful because he'd been bringing all this tragedy against him. And rather than kill Abram for doing what he did, he just sent him packing back to Canaan. And now he was leaving with a huge spiritual lesson, but he was also leaving much more uh, valuable and rich. When they get back to Canaan, there is a problem, though. Even though the uh, drought had ended, the increased herds they have between Lot and Abram, they're too much for the land that they settle at. And so Abram, and again, I had a map I wanted to show you. I'm kind of sad that's missing. But you get to see as they're standing in the south, just having entered into Canaan, there on the east where you have the Jordan River going through, you have this rich green area where you could irrigate. And it's just beautiful. Leads down into the Dead Sea. And then there are mountains, and then on the other side, you have what's now the main part of Israel, and much of that has been transformed into beautiful, productive land, but it wasn't quite as awesomely looking in that day and age. And Abram, even though he is the senior, even though he has raised Lot, and literally everything Lot has it depended upon Abram. And Abram says to him, Lot, you see what's over there on the right-hand side? You see what's there on the left-hand side? To the east and to the west? I'll give you first choice. Now, you might think that Abram, uh, that Lot would immediately think how much he owes his uncle. If it did occur to him, it was a fleeting thought. <laughs> he couldn't overcome his desire to have the absolute lushest and greatest of land that there was. Unfortunately, as our verse here says, the people of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. Two cities, wicked cities, I mean cities with very wicked people in them. Sodom and Gomorrah were also there where everything was so beautiful. And isn't that the way that it often is? That which looks most attractive also has some of the greatest pitfalls. So Lot says, I want what's to the east, which was to the right then. And off he went. And then Abram went to the left or to the west side 
of the land that was leading up to the Mediterranean Ocean. This fall, I came across a study of Hebrew. It was just one paragraph long by Dr. Eli Zorkin Eisenberg. Um, the last few years, I've been getting a lot of emails from the Jerusalem Bible Institute, and it's just absolutely been a huge blessing to find out all the things I didn't know about uh, Hebrew insights into our Christian faith. My Hebrew is really terrible, but um, the four directions that he talked about kind of reminds me a lot about First Nations culture. Because for most people with European background, you know, North, East, South, West are simply directions. Um, West is where the weather comes from, and North is where I try to avoid in the winter. I don't ever dream of taking holidays to Alaska. Um, and South, um, that's not a place I go too often because I had a really bad experience with a border guard, so now I just buy Canadian instead of going across the border. And um, But in Israel, to the North, they would refer to as Safona, and that was the name of a mountain. It's actually in Syria, but it really stood out to them. And it was very significant for a couple of reasons. One, mariners who were out on the Mediterranean, they saw that mountain uh, not just as something that was a site that they could kind of take their bearings by, but they saw that as the place that gathered thunderstorms. And so it meant trepidation and fear and concern to them. But more informative to us is that this was considered by the Canaanites who had their god Baal. It was considered as being his home. That's where his throne was. A god who demanded child sacrifice. Really, they practiced child genocide. You can see some of the paintings that have been done where they would make a metal image of Baal and at his, um, in his mouth, they would build a big fire and then parents would go up this hill and then throw their babies in there because they thought if they gave their babies, their young children, Baal would bless them. Erda, I couldn't help but read your cup when I was sitting back there. And it just struck me, if I could only take a time machine and go back to those days and give to every Hebrew person who was tempted to worship Baal, that cup, every child matters, or a pin. They didn't understand how wicked and evil that was. And so they would leave worshiping God, following his word and his spirit, and they would follow the God of that mountain up there in the north and do the worst of evil. To the south is the Negev or the Negba. And as I mentioned before, it's not a place, especially if you have cattle, you don't want to take them there because you're going to lose them. If they don't uh, die from thirst, they're going to die from starvation. This was also um, a huge spiritual lesson to the people. They need to keep their eyes on the Lord and go in the directions where he leads them to abundance. And the other thing is, the South also represented that was the direction that Abram went when he was using his own thinking power. The drought was on. What do I do about it? He didn't stop to pray. Instead, he just reacted, and he went off. And that's when he got tempted to lie about Sarah. And you know, we talked about that trouble. 
That was a very serious sin. The Negev or the South represented a way that Abram um, almost destroyed the promise that God had given to him that he would bless Abram and he would be the father of a great nation with descendants more numerous than the grains of sand on the seashore. And all because he didn't consult God about the most important. To the east, or the Kedma, as they stood on the high place and looked to the east, you can imagine for Abram, that brought memories of where he was born. His first memories were to the right or to the east. And then he would remember the call of God. So perhaps the beginning of, we might call it a conversion experience for Abram, he would look to the east, and that was the significance for him there. But it also, looking to the east, represented the direction of the Garden of Eden, God's perfect place of creation, the place where humans fell for the lie from Satan that they could be like God, just eat the apple, disobey God. And that Looking to the east also reminded them the spiritual lesson that that's where sin took root in the human race. It was also, though, the place where God promised to one day redeem his fallen people and he would crush Satan for his wickedness. And we know that on the cross of Calvary, as Christ died and paid the price of sin for all of us, that he sealed the certain fate, the doom of Satan. And right now, he's on borrowed time. And I believe as we see disasters around the world, including the pandemic, it's a signal to us that we need to get our hearts right with God because the time is not endless before Jesus returns and brings a new heaven and a new earth into being. Finally, to the west, or the Yama, is the sea. The Mediterranean has marked the edge, the western edge of the Holy Land, and has been a great resource for the people of God. It's brought food as they go fishing, and it's been the route for commerce. But it also today is bringing a rich promise of oil and so there's a new wealth coming to the nation but with so many things not only was there good came with the Mediterranean but there was evil the menace of the Romans who came and um, subjugated the Israelites the Jews and um, they longed for freedom from the bondage of the Roman people. The West was and is significant for Israel, but it's also significant for us as Christians as we look back and we see how the gospel, starting with the Apostle Paul, spread west upon the Mediterranean. It was easy travel. He could get on uh, boats that were hauling things and he could travel there. So this week, I want you, I want to invite you to go back to Genesis 13, 14 and just spend some moments reflecting and making some notes. Here's the verse that the Lord challenged Abram with after Lot had departed. Look around from where you are to the north and the south, to the east and to the west. Each one of those directions had spiritual significance. It wasn't just the arrow on um, a compass. It had spiritual significance. So I would challenge all of us, as we lift up our eyes to the Lord this week, Lord, what do you want me to see? 
Do I need to look north and confess I've been looking away from God, maybe substituting some kind of physical or emotional or spiritual idol, putting it in the place that belongs to our Lord? Remember, God does not share. He will always seek to draw us back to him. But it might be painful if we force him to bring us back rather than just do the best thing to repent and willingly come back to him. Let us not try our Lord's patience in any way. Do I need to look south? Reflect on your journey. Where have you come from? What are the events that have happened in your life? Maybe something very recent, maybe something way back in your life. Are there spiritual lessons that I've learned, but they become faint in my memory and weak in my heart? Maybe we can renew those spiritual lessons. Let them have more control and impact in our lives. Or maybe the Lord wants you to share that with somebody in your family or maybe a friend? Do I need to look east to appreciate what the Lord called me out of? Appreciate the journey he has led me. The bounty has always blessed us with. And of course, it's always valuable for us to reflect on the Garden of Eden, what our life could have been without sin being introduced. But be of good courage. Heaven is actually, uh, sorry, the Garden of Eden is actually a picture of heaven, except heaven is much, much better than that. The best is yet to come. When you see the news on TV and you hear the calamities coming, remember to share God does not intend for the world to go on forever. If you read the last chapters of the scriptures, you will see that God has a plan for this world to come to an end and to have an awesome eternity for all those who love and serve him. Invite people to read the last chapters of Revelation of the Bible. And remember, spiritual preparation is much more important than political reaction. That's something I have to give myself a kick in the pants for often because <laughs> I tend to really get into the politics of things. <laughs> and, uh, you know, just have to remember, God is in control here. It's not the politicians that are in control. It's not the World Health Organization. And I need to be tuning my heart so that I understand what he's about. Do I need to look to the West and reflect on the abundant provisions the Lord's always placing before me? I love the images of the salmon coming in in their life cycle from the ocean because that is such a good picture of the abundance that the Lord brings for us. But sometimes I'm so busy with my agenda, I just don't see the abundance that's there. I miss it. And as I look to the West, I think about the mission God has for me. I remember thinking once upon a time that when I reached old age, I would be able to push that button that said autopilot and just kind of coast along. <laughs> there wouldn't be too much strife. There wouldn't be much stress or hardship. I just kind of have arrived and just slowly drift off into heaven. Well, I'm discovering life is even more challenging than ever at this point in life. <laughs> and hence the important need to humble myself to look in all the directions and reflect upon what is God saying to me 
by what has happened in the past, where he's led me from, where he wants to take me to, looking toward his salvation. Yes, there was a disaster in the Garden of Eden, which was perfect. But that was cured and taken care of at the cross of Christ. Do I share that with all of my family and all of my friends? I need to consider the call of God to lift up my eyes to look unto him. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, it is so rich to be able to gather in your name in this place with these people to know that we're related, that you love us, and that you have plans for all of us. Unite us with a powerful sense of ministry that we love the Cowichan people. We love the people of the Cowichan Valley, and we share with them that there is nothing man-made or nothing of nature to be feared, but rather you have offered us life and life eternal, and you place within us your Holy Spirit to lead us in the way of victory, moment by moment, day by day, and week by week. And we give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.